This is Gene Delisio with a featured sports program from WDLB and WOSQ. Prior to the state championship years of the 1990s, Marshfield High School did not have a tradition of football success. Before winning its first state championship in 1997, Marshfield had won only three Wisconsin Valley Conference championships in 1927, 1930, and 1932. The 1927 team was considered Marshfield's best ever team prior to 1997, finishing that season 7-0 and 1. Before 1927, local fans considered the 1917 team, which was 6-1-1, and to be the school's best ever team. In 1987, WDLB produced a documentary on the 60th anniversary of the 1927 Tiger team. We spoke with several players from that team and got their recollections of that season and high school football in the 1920s. At the time this program was produced, there were no surviving members of the 1917 team, but we did speak with several people who saw that team play and who later played themselves for the Tigers in the 1920s. Please keep in mind that prior to the burning of McKinley High School in 1936, Marshfield High School was known as McKinley High School, and the athletic teams were known as the Golden Tigers. So any reference in this program to McKinley High School refers to what is now known as Marshfield High School. And now WDLB and WOSQ present our 1987 documentary on the 1917 and 1927 McKinley High School football teams. Football at McKinley High School in Marshfield wasn't much in the early days. A succession of coaches and losing teams with games played in front of small crowds. But things changed suddenly in 1917 when Al Boots Weimar took over the team. That McKinley squad finished 6-1, and one, their only loss to the Stevens Point Normal College squad. And because they beat all of the local high school teams like Wausau, Grand Rapids, Stevens Point, and Medford, they were declared champions of the Wisconsin Valley, even though there was no formal area conference. There are no survivors of that 1917 team, but Oscar Witt was an eighth grader that year and remembers watching that team. They have a good teamwork, had a real good quarterback, and real good halfbacks, and some real good block and linemen. That is what distinguished that team, and it made it good. They uh, had fellows like uh, McCarr, Reynolds, and Larry Heiser were all good ball carriers, and they could vary around. So that was probably the backbone of the team. The big heroes on that team included center and captain Joe Marsh, quarterback Ed McGar, halfbacks Lawrence Heiser and Charles Whitlinger, fullback Lloyd Reynolds, ends Lloyd Whitney and Frank Tice, and linemen Henry Hazel, Tom Sen, Ivan Vaughn, and George Getz. Key reserves were Clark Hastings, Ben Heiser, Ray Kramer, Ray Felker, Donald Bulmer, and Carl Noel. Marshfield was one of five schools in the state which finished the season undefeated in high school competition. Demand arose for a championship game from several places, most notably the Milwaukee newspapers. The other unbeaten teams were Waukesha, La Crosse, Marinette, and Watertown. And Marshfield officials arranged to have the Watertown team come to Marshfield for a Thanksgiving Day game at the fairgrounds, which they said would decide the mythical state championship. Oscar Witt remembers there was a lot of excitement about that game. It was uh, filled up as much as you could at that time. The papers didn't build it up much, and uh, the, uh, the high school uh, tried everything to, to generate uh, enthusiasm. And the, the business people downtown all were really back of the team. They were, they were push, pushing it along. 
every practice you had about half a dozen businessmen coming out there helping or coaching. I don't know if they helped or if they hurt, but they're out there helping coach. So there was a lot of enthusiasm. And it turned out to be quite a game. I was played on Thanksgiving Day, one of the coldest games I ever saw. And the ground, there a lot of bare ground. They played in front of the grandstand. And the ground was like a rock. And the fellow that went down, he was hurt. But it was very desirable weather. But the fellows didn't seem to mind it there. We always played that late in the season then. I don't remember any passing in the game. There might have been some. I don't remember any, but there might have been. But I don't remember a pass in the game. It was all just slugging it out in the ground. McKinley and Watertown played to a scoreless tie and everyone went home satisfied that a great year was finally at an end. Talk of Marshfield being state champions ended the following week when the Watertown team went to Green Bay and lost to Marinette 27 to nothing. But Marshfield folks were very proud of their team, and that 1917 squad was a big deal in Marshfield for many years to come. Everything was dated to that team. From that team, anything that was done was referred back to compare to that team, and that hurt the, the next few years because they couldn't compare with that team. But everything for many, many years, that was the thing dating back to that game until probably in the late 20s and 30s before you start thinking about their teams. But Marshfield's football fortune slid after 1917. Fred Hanneman took over the football program in 1918 and split two games before the flu epidemic ended the season. Ben Feinberg became the coach in 1919, and he was followed by Dewey Huber. Oscar Witt played for both. Ben Feinberg was uh, very meticulous. He was um, a mathematician, if you could call it that type of coach. Dewey Huber was more of a mixture. He was a, a friend to everybody in the squad, and everybody liked him. He seemed to like everybody on the squad. Huber had some success. His third and final Marshfield team in 1922 went 5-3 and three, with Clark Abbott an all-conference end. Oh, he's a wonderful fellow and he had a very good personality and uh, he was always cheerful and always uh, hopeful and, and everything. And he, he never uh, criticized anybody or anything like that that I can recall. I never heard him say a bad word about anybody. He was a great big fella, and he played uh, pro basketball all the time he was here. He was about probably six foot three or four, heavy set guy. I would say weighed a couple of hundred pounds. Excellent player in basketball, and uh, he and the Marshall always had a city team in those days. And he played on it all the time he was here. Huber went to Chippewa Falls and was replaced by Nicholas Stoneman, who won four games in two years, with Norman Hansen as one of his players. A very nice gentleman, but uh, I don't think he had the coaching ability of Huber. After Stoneman left, William Robinson was brought in for one year. And then in 1926, Marshfield hired a coach out of the lacrosse normal school, Carl Klandrud. Klandrud had never played a game of football, but Vic Ferenbach remembers he made an immediate impact in Marshfield. When he was introduced, it seemed like the whole school came to like him. And uh, I know one of the, of course, he had the, what do you call it, was, um, meetings in the morning, assembly meetings, and he got up and speak to uh, Courtney. He said in order to make a good athletic a season, it took the whole school. And that was his principle, that the whole school had to be behind the, behind the uh, players themselves and, and get that enthusiasm going, and which he did. 
With only three winning teams in 18 seasons, Clandred had his work cut out for him. As Harold Widman recalls, Marshfield wasn't exactly known for football. They were patches. They, they had uh, no formal athletic program starting in the in the elementary schools or the junior high schools had very little uh, formal programming athletic wise Sandrid came in and, and initiated a program getting started in the lower grades and it began to show up Clandred's first team in 1926 went 3-3-2 and Vic Ferenbach and his teammates gained a lot of respect for Coach Clandrud. If something went wrong and things were not going right, he uh, it wasn't the person who would raise his voice and, and uh, get everybody else excited. He, like I say, he would be uh, one who would take him on the side and tell him what he's doing. It should have been some other way to watch him out for it. I think that uh, that was one of the reasons that the, the team held together and all played hard from the, from the beginning with them until the finish. There were some additions for the 1927 team. New players included Vic Cresty, who quickly discovered that Clandred was a great coach. He was a smart coach, and he was a very good gentleman. I never heard him cussing anybody or hitting anybody or anything like that. Just a real good man, and uh, he, he knew his football, and uh, he knew how to get the boys to, to work for him, and it was a success that that uh, came to him because of that fact, I think. And Clandrude got a new assistant for 1927, Al Bitzer, who Harold Widman gives a lot of credit for Marshfield's success. I remember the first day of practice, Al Betzer, first time we'd met him, we'd been throwing the ball around a little bit and never did not even know who the fellow was. And he lined us up, and at that time, of course, you could use your hands, the heel of your hand, on defense. <laughs> we lined up, Al was, Betzer was right opposite me, and the next thing I knew, I was sitting on my tail about 10 feet back, and my headgear was about 10 feet the other direction. He taught me how to use your hands. I didn't get caught in a situation like that again. And Vic Christie recalls Bitzer was a real workhorse. He had to do the tough work. He had to go in there right in, down in the line with the boys and show them how to do it. And uh, if he didn't like the way we did it, he would show us how to do it. And he took some lumps doing it, but uh, we all got along good as Sal. He was a he was a good friend of the boys. Never any squabbles, you know, or any meanness. He, he just was a good good coach. I liked him. Flanders was easy going, you know, and he knew he was very firm. And when he told you to do something, he expected to get results. Mm -hmm. But uh, Al, he was a little more. Uh, Oh, uh, as you say, uh, a little more high-strung, and uh, he'd, li he'd like to get the results much quicker, <laughs> which I can't blame him for. It. The Clandred bitzer team made a pretty good combination for Ray Hellickson. Well, I remember a lot about Clandred because I played for Clandred, under Clandred in college also, and uh, he was an outstanding coach, well-liked by everyone and well-liked by his players. And the same goes for Al Bitzer. He was, he was a wonderful man, wonderful coach. The 1927 McKinley High School football team began practicing in early September. Although some players, like Harold Widman, had done some preseason conditioning. About five of us got together about a week before school started and worked out, well, as a matter of fact, five of us went up to a lake up near Phillips. Uh, there was Arnie Seidel and Johnny Schlecht, Johnny McCorson, and myself, and Ray Schuler went up there to a lake. We took a football along, and we just threw that ball around for six hours a day and got into shape. 
And that was at Andrew's suggestion that we would we would show up for practice in shape. And we did. Vic Christie remembers those early conditioning drills. First days, I suppose, it was a lot of running. We had an old sender track up there at the old McKinley High School, and we'd always do laps before the game, and then even after we were pretty well bushed, we still had to do a lap or two and then go in and take a shower. But that was our limbering ex exercises, of course. And Although we were all pretty active and we played baseball and we were out for track and all that sort of thing, too, in the summertime, we practiced up for what we call the uh, relay team. We, uh, we had a relay team contest against Wisconsin Rapids every year at the fair. And uh, we'd have to practice during the summer and go out to the fairgrounds and run around the track. And so we were in pretty good shape when the football season came along. So it wasn't a lot of sore muscles and aching backs like if you just come off of a... Uh, vacation and hadn't been working or exercising, it would have been a little tougher, but uh, we got into it pretty easy. And Vic Ferenbach recalls Coach Clandred's practices were pretty tough. And usually before we, we would get ready to go in for a shower, the coach would line up uh, all of the fellows that uh, were expected to be playing in the, in the coming game, maybe 10 yards apart, and all in the backfield, both first and second team, would run through them. And you had to have three perfect tackles in a row, and then you could take a shower. And you know most of us all took our showers together. <laughs> the three perfect cat-on tackles <laughs> was is something that's pretty hard to to accomplish. But that was one of his, his methods. Uh, to get him to hit. And also get the fellows that were running with the ball to run hard. Gave him 10 yards in between, he got a good start. The 43 men out for the 1927 team included returning veterans like Captain John Schlicht, Arnie Seidel, Frank Allen, Ed Reich, Vic Ferenbach, and Bill Miller. Among the new players was a newcomer to Marshfield, Arnold Marks. When I was at Big Falls, we had uh, a two-year course there, uh, freshman and sophomore. We alternated there. One year we'd have freshman subjects, and the next year we'd have uh, sophomore subjects. And my principal, uh, Mr. A.J. Wanro was from Marshfield, and I had indicated to him that I would like to play football, and then he said that if I wanted to stay at his home at Marshfield, I could go and stay there, which I accepted that proposition, and then that's how come I got to Marshfield. I didn't know anybody uh, at all. And the first person that I knew was when I was walking up to the uh, McKinley High School was Ray Grawl. And I said, what do, you, what do I do here? And all he says, uh, what grade are you in? I said, I'm a junior. Oh, he says, I am too. He said, you just follow me. And so he showed me what to do. And Marks had some difficult times in practice. I was uh, right end, and on practice we were to run down the punts. And I think Johnny McCarson was doing the punting, and uh, Ray Grawl was the receiver. And as I ran down the punt, and I tackled Ray as he caught the ball, and I caught him right around the knees and spun him around, and uh, I said, oh, I said, Ray, excuse me, and he says, that's all right, that's what you're supposed to do. As they assembled, Marshfield players agreed on one thing. Their strength would be their backfield. The best known of the backs was Arnie Seidel, as Vic Christie recalls. He was a good track man. He was a good, great basketball player, too. And uh, I thought he was one of the better football boys we ever had up there. 
and uh, he was a little hot-headed. He'd get pretty excited at times and get mad. But I guess that made him play just a little harder. That's why he was such a good player. <laughs> but uh, he got along good with everybody. But uh, there was other fellows in the backfield there, too. There was Schlicht, who was a wonderful quarterback. And uh, Bill Miller, he was, went down to university after a while, you know, and played down there for, <coughs> for a while. But uh, he was probably the biggest man in the backfield, and yet he was the fastest man we had on the team. He was also a track man. And uh, that helped us get a lot of scores, too. But he was rough and tough. Mm -hmm. But uh, Seidel and Schlitt and Miller and Harvey McCorson, they were all great backfield men. Dr. James Vedder also recalls that backfield. Yeah, well, this one fellow, Bill Miller, was the... Um uh, was the only junior, junior of the group. The rest of them were all seniors. But he was a big fellow. He weighed, probably weighed 210 pounds uh, in that facility. And when he take the ball, he could usually drop off some yardage. And, uh, and uh, the other fellows, uh, one of the uh, uh, best runners we had was uh, John McCorse, and uh, he did cut uh, like crazy like Hirsch of later days. And uh, Arnie Seidel was the other halfback, and, and they did very well. Uh, he did very, very well, too. And the uh, Schlick was the quarterback, as I recall, Johnny Schlick. And he went to River Falls with, with Clandred and went to school there after, uh, after he graduated. Vic Ferenbach remembers quarterback John Schlitt. We called our own signals. You know, it wasn't like they do now. And Schlitt became a very heady quarterback. He would, uh, of course, we had instructions that if uh, we found that we had, the man we were working against had some flaw that... Uh, uh, we could overcome overcome them on. Uh, we report that to the quarterback, and immediately he'd start thinking about a play to run over there. And that's what took place for most of his quarterbacking, as far as the team would help him that I could take out their man, or, or this fellow was uh, doing this or that. And as far as. Uh, he also could carry the ball along with uh, blocking. And Harold Widman recalls those backfield guys weren't only good in football. The football backfield was also your quarter mile relay team in track. They were running together, they were fast. And uh, that quarter mile relay team in the in the fall and in the spring, both were, uh, were picking up wins all over the state. Uh, Johnny McCorson was a driving force. He was an excellent pullback. He could always depend on Mac for three or four yards. Bill Miller, or Miller as he liked to be called, was a powerful, built little fellow. And he carried his share of the load. But Vic Ferenbach also thinks the offensive line was part of the backfield success. Well, it takes good tackle, it takes good guards. And when the going gets tough, they, uh, they're down in the pit. And then when they're, they're taking a beating, there's no question about it. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't pick out any one of them that was was not doing a good job because they, they all knew what they had to do and did it. It was just, uh, they wanted to play football, let's put it that way. As the 1927 season began, the Marshfield players were optimistic. Because of the final game Vic Ferenbach and his teammates played in 1926. Uh, Wasser was slated to come over and beat us at a uh, score of something like 90. It's, it's nothing. We played in a snowstorm and a sleet, and uh, we held them to a nothing to nothing tie until the last about five or six minutes. And one of our tackles got hurt, and they ran the play over and we had a touchdown. 
that game ended in the 90, it, on Saturday night, to nothing, it was seven they only had, and we didn't have any. But from then on, we just said that from here on, this is our start for next year. And it seemed like it was the feeling of all of the fellows that had played, because a lot of the fellows were juniors. And the season began successfully for Marshfield with a 58 to nothing win over Nielsville. Vic Ferenbach remembers. Yeah, Nielsville was a bad, had a bad uh, team that year. And the Olds had a bad place to play on. In fact, they had a chance to cause off the field. And uh, personally, I ran into some of those plates. <laughs> I was looking for water to wash off. But... Uh, on his side, I think, had the best day of uh, his career there as far as touchdowns concerned because it seemed like he was getting the ball and down near the 20-yard line, he was over. Seidel scored six touchdowns that day as Marshfield outgained Nielsville 445-40. to Marshfield went to Medford the next week, and traveling to games was a lot different back then, as Harold Widman recalls. At that time, you had no such thing as uh, uh, a coach, I mean a, a van or anything to carry your players there. Your, all of your out-of-town games, you were dependent on some of your followers at home were driving their car and taking two or three or four players to the game site. You didn't have any bus to take you there. And uh, after a game was over and you got dressed, you were separated from the rest of the players pretty well. Early 20s players like Clark Abbott and Norman Hansen had some interesting travel experiences. Well, usually in the football season, we traveled by car. Uh, we go in three or four cars or whatever is necessary to carry the team, and uh, <clears throat> uh, and some games we used to make by train. But I don't think in football. I think in during the football season. See, we only played eight games, and uh, uh, I think that all of those trips were made by car. One year we. Coming back from Merrill, we hit a cow on the road, <laughs> killed a cow. That was over near uh, Moon Bridge. I remember one time that we always rode with some older fan that had cars, you know, they'd take the team up there. And I remember one time we played it, I think it was Wausau, and we couldn't find the guy we uh, came up with so one of the other fellows myself started hitchhiking back to Marshfield there was no or real organization of transportation when Oscar Witt played between 1919 and 1921 he did a lot of traveling by train didn't have any buses or any cars to to uh, take the whole team down, so everything's done done by train. Even went the Rapids or Point went by train, and even some of their uh, fellows that came to school that lived uh, within ten miles of town came in by train. They, they didn't have cars. No matter what the method of travel, Marshfield was successful as Bill Miller scored four touchdowns to lead McKinley to a 43 to nothing win. And it was a memorable game for Harold Widman. Tonight before that Medford game, I went down with a shoulder separation. But I still showed up, made the trip the next day with a, a horse collar taped on my shoulder and played part of the game. That was also the first game ever seen by newcomer Arnold Marks. Uh, Medford team had the ball, and as the ball was passed back to the quarterback, I rushed across the line, and I tackled them about as soon as he got the ball. And, and the coach said that was very good to do that. I, in the excitement of the game, I know I 
did what I was coached to do, and that was box in the runners and got to get across the line, and then if anybody come, came that way with the ball, you'd be sure to tackle them. And uh, I don't recall the that is the any other outstanding thing in in the game that I did, but I know it was. Uh, a nice feeling for us to, for for me to play in the first game in, in my life and also to win it. Edward Hayes, Irvin Sheasel, and Ollie Deckard all did great jobs in the line for Marshfield that day. And the following week, Dick Normington and Ed Reich had to fill in for injured players. But Marshfield kept winning, beating Antigo 25-7. to Vic Christie remembers that trip to Antigo. Uh, Antigo was a, was a good game. It was a hard-fought game. I remember, uh, uh, who was it, uh, Bournes, Ralph Bournes? He was a tackle, I believe. He was a real good player. And he got hurt pretty bad. And uh, he was he was playing. Uh, he didn't know which way to run. He was so um, badly beat up. So he was right in there pitching. And I remember he bit his tongue. <laughs> he was bleeding. And you know, he, he was a sight to see. And uh, everybody got a little scared. And, of course, they took him out then. But he was a real tough operator. And uh, they all had to play hard that day because they had a good team. The one thing I always remembered about that uh, game was the beautiful field they had up there to play on. Most of the places were old cow pastures or something like that, that, like we had in Marshfield for a long time. And up there it was just like a lawn, you know, beautiful green grass and uh, a real nicely kept field. The only blemish on Marshfield's 1927 record was a 6-6 tie with Stevens Point the fourth week of the season. Point took an early 6-0 lead, Marshfield lost two fumbles deep in Point territory, and the McKinley squad got the ball back one final time at their own 21-yard line with five minutes to play. Marshfield drove 79 yards for the tying score, and Dr. Jim Vetter remembers that drive. He's over at Stephen's Point. We had to follow. We had to follow the ropes back and forth. They didn't have any bleachers there in those days either. And uh, I was uh, marching along up with them and suffering with the team as they were going along. But uh, the big surprise was that they didn't tie it. A 43-yard pass from Seidel to Ferenbach set up a short touchdown run by Seidel. But then Marshfield committed a fatal mistake, according to Harold Widman. Of course, at that time, your equipment was altogether different from what it is today. Uh, you wore regular football cleats. Uh, and when you were playing in the mud, you had different shoes that you wore with mud cleats on them. Instead of taking time to change to regular shoes or regular cleats, Arnie Seidel tried the point after touchdown with mud cleats, and that was our downfall. Seidel missed the extra point, and Marshfield did not get the win. But Jim Vetter still thinks Coach Clandra deserves credit for at least getting the tie. That looked like we were going to start off the uh, season. It looked like it was going real great. It looked like we were going to get knocked off. And, but uh, when Mr. Clandra's calm demeanor saved the day, I think he didn't, he didn't jump up and down and pull a lot of men out. You had to stay in there and keep plugging along. Seidel missed the extra point, and Marshfield did not get the win. But Jim Vetter still thinks Coach Clandra deserves credit for at least getting the tie. It looked like we were going to start off the season. It looked like it was going real great. It looked like we were going to get knocked off. And, but uh, when Mr. Clandra's calm demeanor saved the day, I think he didn't, he didn't jump up and down and pull a lot of men out. You have to stay in there and keep plugging along. Seidel's cleats remind us that there were many differences in football back in those days. Oscar Witt recalls one big rules difference. Wherever you ended up on uh, where the down was, if you were a yard from the sideline, that's where the next play started. You didn't go in the middle of the field. 
if you scored a touchdown on the corner of the field, you kick the pointer touchdown from that corner of the field. Not in front of the goalposts like they do now. So there weren't too many points made <laughs> because it's difficult angle so often. There was a time when the center was right at the edge of the sideline. So he'd pass back. And your formations that time were all a um, uh, T formation, which is probably better known as a Rockney formation. And you'd line up from that. And the direct pass from center, always. It didn't go with the quarterback and hand it off. You, uh, the snap went directly to the fellow who was carrying the ball. There wasn't much passing back then. Norman Hansen's teams in the early 20s only threw several times a game. Very few were completed. The ball really wasn't made for passing those days. You know, it was more like a pumpkin. If you threw two consecutive incomplete forward passes, you were penalized five yards. So it was mainly a running game for Harold Widman and his teammates. Most of your players were were uh, uh, fears off of the end, inside, outside the end, inside the end, off tackle, a few cross bucks uh, mixed in there. That was the extent of your offense. And even Harold Widman's blocking duties were different. Uh, with our line averaging somewhere in the 140-pound range, old team not much heavier than that, um, you, didn't, you didn't do a lot of physical blocking. It was more or less of a check block. But if you threw a block and a man and you hit him above the knees, why, you were in for, you were in for disciplinary action with your coaches. Uh, you blocked below the knees. You, you knocked a man down or you and hit the ground yourself. You better get on your, be on your feet and get another man. That's the only way a team weighing 140 pounds could compete with 170 pound teams. Marshfield's next contest was a home game with Merrill. But the night before that game, Vic Christie and the other Marshfield players were treated to a monster pep rally. Oh, that was always a big night. I guess it was on a Friday night they would usually have them, you know, because we always played on Saturday in them days, as I recall. And they would uh, have what they call the snake dance, you know, and they would go up and down Main Street and into some of the stores, which the merchants didn't think too much of that, of course, <laughs> because there was always a little pilfering, I imagine. But uh, they would have a big bonfire at, at the school grounds, you know, and lots of singing and whatnot. And, uh, it was always a great night. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of fun. But Jim Vetter was one Marshfield player who didn't participate in pep rallies. Never told us to not to go to those rallies, but to go home. It can get a good night's sleep. <laughs> Dr. Vetter had a very important role against Merrill because center Ollie Deckert was hurt, and he had to start. Victor spent the whole week working on me, blocking after I passed the ball from center and to get moving as a, as a backfield uh, uh, supporter of, uh, of any, uh, any uh, run through the line. That, that. And uh, the uh, one thing was that uh, uh, Merrill uh, uh, had a, a system of calling where they would all bunch up and, and get their uh, get a zone and it, it, the whole half the team would go marching around one end or the other and would try to flank uh, the team and uh, and I was in the, uh, the immediate backup there and, and I went charging in and didn't realize that I was so excited to be on the on the team that, uh, that uh, I noticed that uh, when I would uh, um, get up with him. Uh, this already tackle one of these guys, and he'd stumble and fall. It happened repeatedly during the game. But it was a, if it hadn't been for the type of uh, 
Marshfield beat Merrill 31 to 6 as Ernie Seidel scored three touchdowns, one on a 33-yard pass from John Schlicht. Marshfield was now in second place in the conference, a half game behind Wausau and a half game in front of Wisconsin Rapids. And Rapids was coming to the Marshfield Fairgrounds the following week. The Fairgrounds wasn't a great football field, but Vic Ferenbach thinks it was better than Marshfield's previous field. I didn't take part in that, though. That was played on the first uh, airfield that was put up for Birdhammer. And that didn't work out too well, but then they got permission to the city to use the inner, inner uh, field of the uh, racetrack. And of course, it was just nothing more to feel. It was, it was better than most, and better than most of our competitors has even had. But it wasn't like to have today. Between 1919 and 1921, Oscar Witt played on the front lawn at McKinley High School. But the high school wasn't bad, except that the end of the football field was uh, on a the sidewalk surrounding the field. So if somebody went over the sidelines, the end lines, he landed on the sidewalk. And that had happened a couple of times. Fellows get concussions from landing on the sidewalk. But by the time Clark Abbott played in the early 20s, most of Marshfield's games were at the fairgrounds. We had a field out there that was a good field, but it was um, um, overgrown with grass. It was fairly well, fairly level, well leveled out. But one end was about three feet higher than the other end. And so uh, there were disadvantages as part of the game <laughs> to each team, though. The fairgrounds didn't have much accommodations for fans, as Dr. Jim Vetter recalls. They had ropes along the sidelines, and they stood on... There were no grandstand seats or, or bleachers. They just followed the team. Uh, there weren't enough people to get in the way. So you, you probably, if you had uh, 25 to 50 people, you had a big crowd at the game. Aside from the big games, Marshfield didn't need room for a lot of fans. Although Harold Widman recalls McKinley had a few big boosters. We had some pretty good followers there that were very helpful. I remember one in particular was Louis Lamley, who had a clothing store there. He was one of our most avid followers. And he would do anything for any of us players that he could. But by and large, oh, at any of our home games, we might have 40 people at a game. And of course, there were no bleachers or anything like that on the fairgrounds. Uh, your, your spectators would pretty well patrol the sidelines. Uh, 40 or 50 people would be a big crowd in addition to maybe that many students. Despite the playing conditions, Rapids came to Marshfield and McKinley was ready, thanks in part to Harold Widman. That was the only game that I know of that we actually had scouted the opposition before the game. And that was Gunson Rapids' game. Al Bitzer picked me up, and he and I went to the Rapids to watch them play the week before that. 
and we pretty well had an idea of what, what we were up against with them. Marshfield won the game 26 to nothing as John McCorson scored three touchdowns. But Marshfield still trailed Wausau by a half game. And the big game was next. Wausau wasn't the great football power they would be in later years, but they were defending conference co-champions. And the only time Marshfield had ever beaten Wausau was in that championship 1917 season. Nonetheless, these two teams would battle for the Wisconsin Valley crowd. And Vic Christie and his teammates would have a lot of rooters in Wausau. There weren't too many cars around then, but uh, there were no buses, except for the players. So the people that come, they had to come in their own cars. You know, and they, there was a lot of people that had five, six, seven people in the cars in order to do it. The superintendent had his car, and the principal had his car, and any teacher that had a car, of course, he was calling players or uh, audience along, too. But we did have a bus for the players. But it was a good thing because I, I remember the Wausau game. It was a cold day. It was, it was real cold and windy, and uh, they gave all the linemen gloves to wear when they were on defense. It was a as long as you didn't have to handle the ball, well, you could get down on the ground there and, without freezing your knuckles. And then during the half, we never even got into the school building. They just took us into the bus. And we sat there for 15 or 20 minutes or half an hour and got warmed up good in the bus. And then we went back right up to the field and finished off the game. The players went to Wausau early so that Arnold Marks and the rest of the team could enjoy a pre-game meal. Uh, we ate at the Mint Cafe, and uh, the Mint Cafe at Wausau had silver dollars in the tile floor. And I still recall the coach as well. Now, we, he ordered what we were to eat, and that was poached eggs on toast. That's all we could eat before the game. After the game, we could eat other things. And that was our meal before the game, poached eggs on toast. And uh, the... Uh, Later years, I went back to the Mint, and I noticed those silver dollars were still there on the floor. As the game began, Wausau embarked on some long drives, but Harold Widman and his line mates stopped them. They were down on about a two or three yard line. It looks like they were going for a score. This is relatively early in the game, or in the middle of the game, when it made a difference. And they were just beating us to pieces in the line. The only thing I can remember about that was your center and your guards and your tackle. All we did was eat dirt on that last couple of yards there. We went down low and, and stopped them. Uh, you went down low and got all the arms and legs you could find. The game was scoreless at halftime, and Dr. Jim Vetter remembers the intermission. I remember we didn't have any place to go in the locker room. We went over to one end of the field under some trees. And it said, these guys are bits of both and keep going. These guys are, are beat. And, they, and how they figured it out, but they, they aren't hitting hard at all. And they're just uh, lobbing in there. And you guys get in there and give it all your best work, and you're going to beat them. And sure enough, that's what happened. The halftime break fired up the Marshfield boys because Vic Christie remembers McKinley turned the game around in the second half. Well, I couldn't begin to tell you what happened, but uh, whatever it was, the whole team seemed to catch fire, and uh, we just didn't do anything wrong, I guess. And uh, that was a result of it. Uh, after we scored a couple touchdowns, well, then uh, the other team, they were so uh, discouraged that it was going against them so bad, not doing anything in the first half at all, and then being scored on uh, quite soon in the second half. 
uh, I just took the heart out of them, and there was just a race after that. So no competition. They just gave up. John McCorson scored two Marshfield touchdowns in the second half on short runs. But Wausau marched down the field again, trying desperately to stay in the game. Wausau had the ball deep in Marshfield territory and tried to pass. McCorson intercepted on the nine-yard line and had clear sailing 91 yards to the end zone. Vic Ferenbach and Vic Christie remember that interception run. McCorson was carrying the ball with, with a Wausau man following him about uh, two arms lengths behind him. Both of them galloping as far as as hard as they could, and neither gaining an inch on each other. And when you looked on the field, there wasn't a man standing. <laughs> the job was always as candid would say with a man. If there's a opponent standing up, he should be down. <laughs> and and it, as I looked up, I see that the whole field was down, and there was just those two two runners. And they were both, their speeds were equal. But he took it in for a touchdown. That was the last one, I think. I got to carry him off the field. He got a terrible uh, Charlie horse from that. He didn't play anymore uh, the rest of the game. But he was in terrible pain. I could still, of course, we were all following him down the field, you know, right behind him, right on the heel. But he never looked back. He just kept running. <laughs> It was a great game. Marshfield now had a big lead, and for Jim Vetter, the game was no longer in doubt. By the last few minutes of the game, the score was 20 to nothing. And Cranford didn't put me in for a few minutes, which I never expected to play in all of a sudden. They were crying, like uh, sobbing, and they uh, needed the crying towels brought out, as they say. Marshfield won 20 to nothing to take first place in the Wisconsin Valley Conference. McCorson got a lot of headlines with his three scores, but Ray Hellickson thought there were some other unsung heroes that day. One thing I can recall about the, the Lion play of uh, Eddie Hayes and Harold Whitman. Uh, they, they were great for two more or less small men. They played a great game. Marshfield now had the inside track on the league title, but Harold Widman and his teammates weren't celebrating. The people in town, our followers, gave more thought to that than we did. We were playing one game at a time, and we were just doing our best. And we were playing one game at a time, we weren't even thinking about the championship. Of course, I, I think that's a mark of good coaching. And how did Wausau respond to their defeat? The next week, they beat Medford 100 to nothing. That next week, Marshfield could wrap up their first league title with a win over Nakusa. Dr. James Vetter remembers the Marshfield squad was well prepared. Patrick was smart. He kept us on the edge, on the edge by telling us that, uh, that point over, that avoid overconfidence. And uh, uh, the Cousas had a pretty good record. They were for, for small. He pointed out that the uh, was a school comparable size uh, that uh, uh, Wausau was. Uh, we were the Wausau, and they were the uh, Nakusa was the uh, small town high school like Marshfield. And if uh, we didn't keep the dumbers up, we're going to wish uh, we're going to be in uh, trouble with him. Marshfield fans wanted to see their favorites clinch a conference title, and about 2,000 fans showed up despite rain and snow, a raw north wind, and ankle deep mud. We had trouble trying to find places on the sidelines to, to watch. They were running back and forth up and down the hill there. Vic Ferenbach remembers that contest with Nakusa. We kicked off to them, and they kept one first down, brought the ball up, one first down after another. They were going down somewhere on the 25 yard line, and Clanwood sent in one substitute. 
And all you, all you told the substitute to tell us is to put on our helmets, boys, or you're going to lose your ball game. And we all knew what he meant. We had the big head. <laughs> That's, uh, but from then on, we started to play a type of a ball that we were able to. But Nakusa had a coach that was... Uh, uh, could feel the team, even though it had one of the smallest schools, the town was behind it more than uh, most other cities. <clears throat> but you could even feel the team, they always gave you a good competition. After a slow start, Marshfield won that game 19 to nothing, as Bill Miller ran for 100 yards and one touchdown and caught a touchdown pass from Arnie Seidel. John Schlicht rushed for 96 yards and scored a touchdown. And Marshfield had its first conference championship. The local fans began to celebrate, and Vic Christie and his teammates were big heroes. The Elks Club had us in for a nice big dinner, and, uh, and we uh, appeared at the, uh, the old Adler Theater. We had to get up on the stage. Everybody was introduced individually, and... There was a few speeches by the teachers and coaches and so on, and it was a regular thing in the days. But, uh, we enjoyed it thoroughly. But the meaning of the conference title was lost on newcomer Arnold Marks. I didn't realize that, you know, uh, particularly by myself, because I was an outsider and I just came in this one year, first year, and. Uh, it didn't dawn upon me anything that was unusual because that was my first year and I thought, well, maybe that's the way that things go. <laughs> Dr. James Vetter recalls that the title allowed some local fans to exhibit their support of the Marshfield team. It was a barbershop. Uh, it was uh, Louis Stoiber. He was on the city council for years. And, he was there, he followed the teams, and uh, he had a big glass tray as a place where his cash register was. And underneath his glass, he had the uh, uh, football chapters uh, listed, and then he had them all written in by their names so they couldn't uh, miss who they were. And that was that was there after World War II was over, he still had it on there, up there. In the next couple of weeks, there were pep rallies and dinners in honor of the team. The Wisconsin Valley Conference All-Conference team included 10 Marshfield players. And as Vic Christie recalls, Marshfield had more to talk about than just 1917. They did brag quite a lot about that, just like we bragged about our team later on. And uh, that made us feel pretty good when we... Uh, won our championship because before that they were the only ones that, in my knowledge, that had a championship team at McKinley High School. And we, we thought that was really something great because they held it for 10 years. And uh, to think that we could come along and do the same thing in about the same way they did it with big scores and all that sort of thing. You know, we felt very good about that. And uh, you didn't hear too much about the 1917 team anymore. It was the 1927 after that. <laughs> Marshfield's football glory didn't last long. During the spring, after leading the Marshfield basketball team to a 14-8 and record and a trip to the state high school tournament in Madison, Coach Carl Clandred announced he was leaving Marshfield to become head football and basketball coach at River Falls Normal. Arnold Marks and the other students were sorry to see Clandrud leave. They liked him very much, and of course they, uh, they did. But the Al Bitzer stayed on for the next year, and so that kind of took some of the sharp edge off from Mr. Clandrud departing. Clandrud was replaced in the summer of 1928 by Jack Murphy. Vic Christie and Jim Vedder both played for Murphy at McKinley the following year. The year that he came, we had that relay team between Wisconsin Rapids and uh, Marshfield at the fair. And he came to Marshfield on a particular day, and he came out to the uh, 
to the Paragons and introduced himself and told us he was a new coach and so on. And I introduced him to the boys who were running the relay, and uh, that was the first time I met him. Uh, we liked him as a coach. He was a wonderful fellow. He just didn't have the material that some of the previous coaches had because, well, we, we lost our complete backfield that year. And there just wasn't enough depth in the squad to uh, have anybody coming up that could take over. So uh, the 28 season was rather a big disappointment. And it was tough on uh, Mr. Murphy because being his first year, you know, and coming into a place that had a championship team before, I imagine a lot was expected of him that he, he didn't get. And uh, you can't blame him for that. He was a very even, even-tempered Irishman, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he was well liked by the players. And, uh, and for a while, uh, we, uh, we missed having Clandra, and he got tired of hearing about it. He told us that we can't keep looking back over our shoulder. We got to get out and make a new name for ourselves, and, and he and he did. Under Murphy, McKinley stumbled to a 2-6 record in 1928 and went 0-6-1 in 1929. But Murphy also had his successes, and his Marshfield team shared conference titles with Wausau in 1930 and Stevens Point in 1932. After that, it was downhill for Marshfield football. No conference titles since 1932, only eight winning seasons since then. And in the eight seasons under Murphy in which Marshfield did not win conference titles, his teams won just eight games. The tough times Marshfield football has had in the last 55 years makes the accomplishments of these championship teams loom even larger. And sometimes players like Jim Vedder enjoy looking back. It was a, great, it was a much bigger deal at that time, and a few years ago by it doesn't seem quite as important. <laughs> and, but it was fun. It was fun at the time, and it still was fun to think about it after all those years involved. It's hard to explain how that 1927 team was so successful. Maybe Vic Christie is right in crediting determination and drive. So we played much bigger teams, much bigger boys, and the only reason I can uh, give her. Uh, making a championship team out of it because we were a little quicker than the other guy and a little more determined probably. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, there was no magic otherwise, I don't think. We hope you've enjoyed our visit with some of Marshfield's football pioneers. We'd like to thank all of the participants who joined us for our program. And we hope that there are some youngsters out there who, 60 years or more from now, will also be reminiscing about a football championship for Marshfield Senior High. And that is the WDLB program on the 1917 and 1927 McKinley High School football teams as presented in November of 1987. This is Gene Delisio reporting.